wanted to uh, introduce a topic of my research that uh, Pacific Seed undertook uh, this year, oh sorry, last year. Um, we've done a lot of research over the last two or three years on plant populations and keeping hybrid seed and a lot of agronomy associated with canola, but one of the bigger issues that's been coming up in the last couple of years is a lot of questions obviously on black leg groups, um, fungicides that are available for use on seed and fertiliser and also uh, foliar fungicides in canola crops. So one of, the, uh, one of the research objectives I took to the Pacific Seeds Board was, well, let's do some more work on behalf of the canola industry. And we spent about a quarter of a million dollars this year on this research alone. Um, to try and get some more information for canola growers Australia-wide on investigating fungicide best practice management, to give some more informed advice on the use of fungicides or combinations of fungicides to either um, suppress or control black leaf. So in doing that, obviously, uh, there was we, we chose four varieties. They were triazine tolerant varieties. Um, they're all from Pacific Seeds, so we knew their genetic backgrounds. We knew they were all different. Uh, they all had different black leg canker, adult, adult canker ratings, and we devised seven different fungicidal treatments, um, which ranged from seed, fertiliser and foliar, and a combination of all of those. So I'll go into more uh, detail in a minute in regards to those treatments. But effectively, it was also to have a look at um, the use of jockey and flutriophol, and where Prasaro has a fit, in the general sense in regards to lower rated varieties versus higher rated varieties. So across Australia there were 23 replicated trials, um, so it's probably the biggest amount of research that's been done on fungicide work in canola for a long time. And the, the sites are listed there for your reference. So there's quite a few sites and the majority of them are obviously located in the medium to high rainfall zones around Australia where we were more likely to get higher levels of infection. Obviously, as with our population trials, one thing that Pacific Seeds does is to ensure that all the trials are designed, conducted and analysed by independent professional organisations. Um, and all of the trials were conducted close to district practice with plot seeders and into different soil types with different paddocks with different histories. So it's into a range of different environments that these trials were sown into. So the the four varieties that were chosen were Crusher, Jackpot, Hyola 555 and Hyola 559. So we had black leg adult ratings ranging from MS to MRMS, MR and then RMR. So a good spread of different varieties with different canker ratings. And the different treatments we had were bare seed, flutriophile, jockey by itself, Prosaro, and then the relevant combinations of each of those treatments. Um, all in fully, obviously fully randomised designs. So we then ensured that we targeted 50 plants per square metre for each of the varieties, so they're all adjusted accordingly because you've got uh, two hybrids in there and two open pollinated varieties. And all of them were adjusted for the different sizes of the, the plots and the different sites associated with this research. Uh, the triazines were applied as per standard industry practice and the reason why we chose triazine varieties is because we could do this work in South Australia as well because there's a lot of interest there, especially on the Air Peninsula relating to the use of fungicides. Um, for the trifold fungicide, um, a fertiliser was applied to the appropriate section of the trial. So half of the trial obviously had flutriophile underneath it and half did not. The standard industry insecticides were applied and triple Hyola triple five was used as the standard for desiccation and all of the trials were direct headed. This is an example of some of the infection that we had at some of the sites on the lowest rating variety in this research which was Crusher which is now probably one of the strongest topics in the industry is to how long Crusher will survive and where will it survive and can growers continue to grow this particular variety. So it was a very good variety to have in there for this part of this evaluation. So it shows you some of the lesions on the leaves that we were getting in some of the sites, but it also shows you the extent of some of the cankering that we were getting at some of these sites also. So some very significant reactions in some of these sites. Grain yields, uh, that's just an indication to you of how the analysis was done with the different software and the different modelling and certainly with spatial variation and the different references there as to how um, 
how the trials were actually analysed both. We've done single site analysis for each of the 23 sites and then once that was done then the biometrician from the University of Adelaide decided that um, there was 22 of those sites that were suitable for the multi-site cross-analysis. That gives you an indication of the dendrogram associated with the clusters for yield with an agglomerate co coefficient value of 0.76 for those people that are interested in that level of detail. And you can see there that there are a considerable number of sites that were clustered with um, similar relative, um, there's a lot of good correlations there with some of those sites and some good correlations there. And then you had another group over here that were reasonably correlated, but obviously there's some big differences between these sites over here and some of these. So it was, it was, and the heat map also is your indicator, of course, of the different correlations between there's the sites along there and the sites along there. So you can actually show you the different levels of correlation we had between the individual sites. The, the graph on the left shows you an example of a highly correlated, two highly correlated sites, so Tamora and Alectown in New South Wales were two of the sites, and you can see there from the graph that there was very high levels of correlation between these treatments. However, if you look at the site on the right, you only have moderate levels of correlation there at point, a value of 0.548, which is where we compared Munglin up to the Alec Town. So a, a result from Western Australia versus uh, one of the same trial in Alec Town in New South Wales. And then of course, of course, as you do with all trial work, you end up with some sites with absolutely no correlation whatsoever. So it was important that I made sure I presented that there were some sites that showed no correlation whatsoever, and that's a classic example of that. The picture on the right is an example of one of the trials in Western Australia, and that was the site at Munganup last year, just for your reference. So what happened? In there, you can see the site mean yields for each of the sites. Um, so we did get some very high yielding sites. For example, something like Westmere, the site mean yield across all of the varieties was 3.56 tonnes per hectare. And some of the lower ones were down around the one and a half tonne mark. So we've got a good spread of yields, site mean yields. You can see the relative heritability values there for each of those trials for the analysis. And we've got some very good CV values here. And the biometrician indicated to me that we had a very good data set to work with. And the relative LSDs are there for your reference. So when you started looking at the results, it was, it was very interesting to start to note that at different sites we were getting some quite substantially different results. But there were some common themes coming out of it, and it's sort of what we predicted, but we had to do all this work to, to work out what was going on. And in general terms, the higher rated varieties at many of the sites showed no significant response to any of the fungicides that were applied or any of the combinations of the fungicides that were applied. However, the lower rated varieties in some of the locations showed some very significant responses from products like Fusaro and Flutriophile and also combinations of Fusaro and Jockey. Um, and there were other sites where some of the fungicides, even on the lower rated varieties, showed no significant response whatsoever for yield. So that's an important point in itself. It does show you how variable the disease is and how variable some of the activity is of some of these fungicides when you're applying them and using them on some of these varieties. When you have a look at the mean oil, there really wasn't a lot of differences, so we didn't see the plus and minus for trifold treatments showing any real significant differences or trends relating to oils um, for the different treatments on the different varieties. So if we, we pull apart the results a bit further, what we really want to know is what specifically happened. And despite there being yielding, so this is in the impact, the flu trifold treated section, regardless of the varieties and all of the other fungicide treatments in that whole section, despite there being yield increases of up to 100 kilograms per hectare for some of the fungicide treatments with some of the varieties, none of these were significantly different. So the flutriophile is obviously was working in quite a few of these situations to protect the lower rated varieties and or there wasn't enough infection in some of the sites 
for it to allow the fungicides to do the work. Some of the varieties by fungicide treatments were significantly different from others. So Crusher TT, Hyola Triple Five and Hyola 559 Bare Seed plus the impact all showed significantly higher yield than jackpot with the impact. So in other words, each of those three varieties across the 22 locations are showing higher genetic yield potential than jackpot. Hyola 559 with Prosaro and Jockey and Impact showed the highest yield over all of the treatments and was significantly higher than Crusher with Impact, Crusher with Jockey and Impact, all of the Hyola 555 treatments, the whole lot, and all of the jackpot treatments. And as I said before, there was no obvious trends with oils across the different seed treatments of the four different varieties. When you go to the no impact section, this is when things got very interesting. Crusher TT with Prosaro showed significantly higher yield than Crusher TT with Jockey or Crusher TT Bear. So this, remember, is in the absence of Flutiophile. Crusher TT with Jockey and Prosaro showed significantly higher yield than Crusher Bear. Okay. Crusher with Jockey was not significantly different to Crusher Bear across the whole 22 sites. Jackpot Bear showed the lowest yield of all the treatments, however there was no significant difference between the treatments. Hyola 555 and 559 showed no significant difference for yields for any of the fungicide treatments over the Bear Seed Control. So in general terms you could say that these results suggest that the jockey treatment on both the lower and higher rated varieties in these particular trials provided no significant, and I underline the word significant, additional yield benefit. They did provide higher yields than the bare seed, but across the 22 trials it was not significant. Following on a bit more, if you look into it a bit further, some of the varieties by fungicide treatments were significantly different from the others. So Crusher TT, Hyola Triple Five and 559 bare seed with no impact obviously, significant, all showed significantly higher yield than jackpot. So again, it was re reinforcing the results for even from the flu trifle section. Triple 559 with Prosaro and Jockey showed the highest yield over all of the treatments and was significantly higher than Crusher TT Bear, Crusher plus Jockey, all of the Hyola Triple Five and, ja and all of the jackpot treatments. So all of the Hyola 559 treatments, including the Bear Seed, significantly out yielded all of the Triple Five and all of the jackpot TT treatments indicating to me higher genetic yield potential for that particular hybrid over the other ones that it was compared to. Again, there was no obvious trends for oil percentages across the different seed treatments on the four different varieties. So if you then, the, the crunch time is to then put that into dollar figures. And so when I did this work, I costed all of the uh, different fungicides out and I costed the hybrid seed versus the open pollinated seed and these are the gross returns associated across those 22 trials regarding each of those treatments and that sort of is indicating to you the dominance of the variety Hyola 559 having the highest black leg rating but also if you look closely at those the results you can definitely see that it has higher genetic yield potential as well. So the gross return implications are, and there's the basis of the assumptions that were made in regards to cost of seed and the cost of Prosara and Impact and Jockey, is that Hyola 559 with or without Impact consistently showed higher returns, up to $100 a hectare over the other three varieties. Crusher with Prosara and Jockey and Crusher with Prosara showed higher returns than Crusher with Jockey or crusher bear seed in the impact treatments, consistently showing higher returns than no impact. With Hyola Triple Five, there was a gen there was generally a trend towards higher returns with the impact applied across all of the treatments, including bear seed. And for jackpot, jackpot with Prosaro and impact showed the highest returns for jackpot, with the overall trend 
showing that all treatments with impact consistently showing higher returns than with no impact applied. There's two other photographs of two of the other trials in uh, Western Australia, one of the ones at uh, Franklin there on the left and the one that was conducted up in Geraldton on the right hand side, just for your reference. Now this is the last part of the, the presentation where w at each of those sites uh, cuts were conducted, internal infection scores were rated on every one of the plots for each of the varieties at every one of the 23 locations, which was a big job obviously. And in nearly every circumstance, two lots of cuts were done to ensure that we weren't um, going in prematurely and not evaluating the material properly at the right time. So we had to ensure that we had the highest level of infection that was going to happen in, in those treatments was going to be there. So we did that and all I wanted to show you was four different locations and this is from the analysis done on the individual locations for the mean blackleg infection levels. And this is a site um, comparison of internal infection levels across the four varieties and the fungicide treatments at Geraldton. It's an example showing a site with lower levels of infection. Okay? So hence the only varieties really that were showing any sort of infection levels were Crusher, which is the lowest rated variety of the four. However, if you go to having a look at the scores that were done at Darken, this is what we call moderate levels of infection. You've now got both Crusher and Jackpot starting to show higher levels of infection as opposed to the higher rated ones which have very little if not any at all, which again makes sense. Remembering though that in all of this work we have to be cognizant of the fact that we have different isolates at different trial sites and that's what's affecting the different varieties to different extents. And that's why it's difficult a lot of the time to exactly work out what's going on. But when you've got this many locations you can certainly pick up some of the benefits and value of the different fungicide treatments. You go to Manglanup and this is a result of a much higher level infection. If you look at the left hand here, you're now up to the 40s and 50% internal infection levels. So your scale has changed a bit compared to the previous sites. And things like Crusher here are certainly showing much higher levels and you can start to see the effect of this, some of the different fungicides compared to the bare treatments. So this is a classic site where you're starting to get some really good activity from the different fungicide treatments. And you'll also know that, know that Jackpot is having similar, but not to the same extent. Whereas the higher rated varieties didn't really benefit whatsoever and there was no real significant levels of internal infection there. Now this is the most interesting one from all of the 23 locations. And this is an example of where sometimes you may need to protect higher rated varieties. Now we all know in Cummins in South Australia that there's been heavy, heavy rotations of the two varieties, Viola 50 and Garnet, for many years and we also know that a lot of the farmers there have been cutting their crops now for years to monitor the internal infections of those varieties and try to determine the longevity of those varieties and a lot, a lot of those growers are actually using all three fungicides as a protective measure on those, even on those higher rated varieties. So in this particular site, something interesting happened. It's the only site out of the 23 where we got some significant responses from the fungicide treatments on the higher rated varieties. The reasoning behind it is that Hyola 50 is in group D you know, under, under the, uh, the current groupings within the canola industry. And Hyola 555 and Hyola 559 have some similar parentage in their background to Hyola 50. So even though they're higher rated varieties, in that particular trial, in that district, there were isolates there that were there from all of the Hyola 50 crops, which is why Hyola 50's internal infection levels are so high there now, that we started to get much higher levels of infection in 555 and 559 relative to the other 22 sites in Australia. So all of a sudden you've now got fungicides starting to do some work on the higher rated varieties where you've got specific isolates in those districts that attack the higher rated varieties. You'll also notice that the lower rated varieties also have infection but we've got the higher rated varieties with equal or higher levels of infection. The key messages out of all of this research is the use of fungicides on specific canola varieties 
requires all factors to be considered. So just looking at one or two things is not enough. So unfortunately, it's very complicated. It's not just the varieties genetic resistance we have to look at, it's rainfall intensity and timing. We've got some pathologists in here today that would agree that there are numerous factors that affect the level of black leg infection that we get and uh, the, sort of in, the sort of difference that it will have on different varieties. Sowing date, rotation, stubble load, types of cultivation, the timing of the sporulation events is also a very important factor. Isolation distances. Previous variety histories are also very important. And one thing I have yet to do is to follow up with each of the trial cooperators to determine which varieties were actually grown on their farm and around the trial to work out what's more likely to have been the isolates at those particular 23 locations and obviously specific black leg groups. So across the 22 locations, some of the selected fungicides or combinations, as I indicated, had yield increases up to 100 kilograms per hectare and the impact treated section up to 200, and sorry, and the 200 kilograms per hectare in the, in the non-impact. Gross returns up to another $120 per hectare. One important point is that at individual sites, and this is a really critical point, some of these lower rated varieties with some of these fungicide treatments showed up to 500 kilograms per hectare yield response. $300 a hectare more for a very, very small investment if you're wanting to grow the lower rated variety. So it's a very important point. Um, so it's also important to notice that, uh, recognise that individual trial results showed some significant yield responses uh, on different, from different fungicide combinations and we've gone through the reasons why that may happen. And it's really important that we don't just use the results from the cross-site analysis from these 22 trials, but you also have a look at each individual trial and their own analysis to make sure that you can understand what's going on at each location. Um, it's also important to realise that this research was only conducted on four specific varieties. And I think it's, you know, you need to keep these results in context with the relevant black leg resistance backgrounds for these four varieties and the current adult resistance rankings and their groupings that they're in. I think it's really important that you stick to the fungicide specifications and all of the factors that are outlined on the GRDC publication, the black leg management guide. I think that the value of genetic resistance is very underrated by the industry and by growers at the moment. And I really think we need a change of, um, of ideas there where we have that advantage in varieties. Let's use some of that genetic resistance to, our, to its potential and let's use the value that's inbuilt in the varieties themselves. I'd also like to mention we need to look at preservation of these triazole fungicides and ensuring that where we don't need to use them, we don't. And where we do need to use them, we use ones specifically that are required for varieties. And if we don't need two or three of them, and we can get away with using one of them, for instance, then we should be looking at that. It's important to recognise that um, if you're considering varieties, um, you've got higher rate of varieties versus lower rate of varieties, the costs associated with those fungicides. So that's an important deciding factor for growers. Some of the observations were that uh, the jockey works internally on slowing the internal infection from emergence to the early seedling stage. Um, hence, that's why when you look at the black leg ratings from the Canola Association, you'll find that when they have jockey applied, they generally have a higher rated, a higher, a higher adult canker rating on the publication. Um, Flutriophile works on the internal infection normally from early to mid plant growth, especially on the lower rated varieties. Neither jockey or impact from all of the trials and all the observations we made were showing any significant visual reduction in seedling black leg lesion infection on the leaves after the three to four leaf stage. Both jockey and impact have shown significant reduction in internal infection and increases in grain yield with the lower rated varieties, MR, MS and below. With flutriophile showing more consistent and more often positive yield responses when compared to jockey treated seed on those lower rated varieties. Prosaro, foliar fungicide has shown significant 
um, reduction in existing leaf infection and reduces the internal infection and has shown increases in grain yield with the lower rated varieties and as I indicated before some of those Prosaro treatments were showing more than half a tonne per hectare yield responses. Thank, thank you for that and I'd just like to acknowledge um, the organisations and the, the businesses there on the right hand side for all of the work they've done in, in helping me with this research. Do, 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 the group, do the panel feel that, that we're at a, at a similar risk with canola and blackleg as we, we've just faced with, with uh, barley powder and mildew in that, in that with increasing uh, exposure to blackleg and you've shown that the, the fungicides are effective and you know maybe some of those MS type varieties are more agronomically suitable. Um, one is that do we face a risk in terms of the the, the breakdown of those fungicides and two I'm interested in in the sort of decision making basis on a, on, a, on a farmer's point of view in terms of the risk risk analysis associated with, with what variety you choose in relation to the, the ongoing risk and the current season out, output. Mm. Well, well we'll get to some of the pathologists to comment on some of their understanding of the disease itself but my, my <coughs> comments from working in canola now for 20 years is that um, more canola, more blackleg. More blackleg, more isolates, more pressure. More pressure, more change, more different, you know, effectively the tighter you get those rotations, the more canola we've got in there, the more likely you are to have a change in that disease to attack the more prevalent or all the varieties that are grown in higher levels. However, some of these lower rated varieties can last years and years in the marketplace in different districts of Australia because the weather conditions they're getting or the areas they're being grown are not so conducive to higher levels of infection. Hence the longevity of cobbler in Western Australia for example. Um, my concern at the moment for the canola industry being very strongly involved for so long is the potential uh, over reliance of lower rated varieties in medium to higher rainfall areas and using as many fungicides as possible to look after them. I'm not really a big fan of that at all. Um, however, I do understand that if you look at a lot of the results, the adaptability of a lot of those lower rated varieties regarding their performance and consistency is a very big factor that a grower considers. So some t in some occasions that actually overrides some of those other decisions that you're talking about. So to sort of, uh, I think that um, overall we're getting ourselves in a position where if we have a lot more canola, um, a lot more disease pressure, and it'll depend, it'll be relative to the amount of lower rate of varieties that are grown in districts compared to higher rate of varieties, and also the different levels of genetic resistance in each of those varieties. So if we're growing crusher from fence to fence in a whole range of districts, um, what we can't, and pathologists can help me out here, what we can't determine at the moment, in my opinion, is will it last a year, will it last two years, will it last three or four years? What we do know is the experience from Air Peninsula is even with higher rated varieties, if you concentrate a number of varieties for three years in a row, blackleg will change and it will naturally start attacking those higher rated varieties. It will. Okay? So I think the important part of this research was to show that yes you can grow low rated varieties, if you want to grow low rated varieties in, in medium and high rainfall areas you, you need to look at protecting them, but my major concern is if we have more and more growers growing more and more low rated varieties in higher concentrations, in shorter rotations, I see that as a, as a significant issue for the industry. You, you, you said Prosyra there has given a little bit of advantage on some of the varieties and slightly you know, higher yields. A lower rate of varieties, definitely. Yeah. yeah. How much of that is sclerotinia and how much of that is blackleg? There was very little sclerotinia in any of these trials whatsoever. I was, I was evaluating that in each and every trial. I think there's only one trial that actually showed some sclerotinia infection of any, of any notable levels. Now I just ask that because in New South Wales, um, sclerotinia is becoming a bigger problem in blackleg. And just about every paddock's got sclerotinia in it. Um, my observations in the last five years, and as m many of you might know, I travel a lot around Australia and look at a lot of trials, is that what's concerning me in Western Australia is the level of sclerotinia building up. 
in a lot more districts than I would have thought and the speed at which it's building up. I'm seeing more sclerotinia in more districts than I've ever seen before. Yeah. People can disagree if they want, but I do a lot of travelling and uh, that concerns me a little bit. It may be something more, it may be specific to the level of canola that's been grown, but it might be specific to the seasons that you're having as well. I don't know. But it is concerning me that we're seeing more and more sclerotinians. Products like Fasaro coming through the way they have with registrations that, that will really help a lot of those growers with those particular situations. Yeah, well, to date, the industry doesn't have any mechanisms for, in my understanding, um, doesn't have any mechanisms for gauging differences in sclerotinia resistance in the different varieties that's actually um, industry endorsed. Uh, so my understanding is that um, with all of the varieties that are out there, if the conditions are right and they're conducive to sclerotinia, all of them will get levels of sclerotinia. So the sort of uh, results that you're getting from Fasaro Certainly in higher scler sclerotinia infection levels, anywhere from 100 to 400 kilograms per hectare of responses is quite achievable from Pasara.